All right, so today we're uh, we're diving into a story, and honestly, it's one of those that's just wild, like watching a car crash, mm -hmm. but in slow motion. Yeah. Except the car is driven by, get this, a lawyer who will be quoting Shakespeare one minute and then ranting about sex toys the next. Yeah. It's 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 really a fascinating study, you know, in how online fame can just twist and turn so quickly, especially when you throw in like the parasocial relationships, the darker side of internet culture, all of that. You're not kidding. We've got articles, forum threads, court documents, you name it, yeah. all chronicling this guy's downfall. But for those who maybe missed the first few seasons of this saga, let's rewind to the beginning. Okay. Nick Rikia, lawyer, family man. Right, right. He built his name, you know, methodically breaking down legal cases on YouTube, had that kind of dry humor people loved, seemed like he was building a real community around his content. Active in those spaces like biggest problem in the universe, comics gay, gradually gaining traction. And then boom, the Vic Mignogna case hits in 2019, which really launches him into this whole other level of spotlight. Absolutely, that was pivotal. Suddenly, he's the go-to for legal analysis, mm -hmm. especially within those uh, those anime communities, and the donations, both to legal funds and D through those super chats. Oh yeah. Start pouring in. It's important to meet that turning point because it really marks a shift, right? From just straight legal analysis into content that's much more driven by his personality. And then he gets this this taste of even bigger fame during the Rittenhouse and Depp versus Heard trials. Huge viewership, appearances on mainstream shows. I mean, think about it. Over 300 grand in Super Chats. It was from that. It's mind boggling. He's rubbing shoulders with like Glenn Beck, Tim Pool even shows up on Infowars. He's become this, this unlikely commentator, seemingly respected. But if we look closely at the sources, you start to see those cracks forming. Exactly. And this is where I think his decisions start to unravel the image that he built so carefully. He makes the move to Rumble and Locals, starts boasting about being uncancelable. They, they have to cancel me. I've made myself effectively cancel proof. They can't they can't do it anymore. I signed a deal with Rumble and Locals, baby. Tells his YouTube audience, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to come over there. Alienating, right. Totally. And it alienated some of his longest supporters while attracting a whole different breed. And the content takes this hard left. Less about the law, more about his personal life, relationships, and, well, let's just say his favorite sex toys. Yeah. There's this weird fixation he develops on something called the Baldo, which, uh, listeners, you can look that up on your own time. You know, he's clearly chasing that constant validation, the donations, yeah. the attention, starts neglecting his schedule, making excuses, becoming more and more erratic on stream. I mean, he's even insulting his own fan base I'm at this point. I'm always going to be me. I'm always going to talk about what I find interesting and funny. And other than, like, if that's not your thing, please never give me money and fucking leave. And this is prime law cow material, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. For those who might not be familiar with the term, a law cow is basically someone the internet collectively points at and laughs at, often while they're, well, self-destructing. And Nick, unfortunately, he starts to become the poster child for this. I mean, there are entire forums dedicated to documenting his every misstep, with Kiwi Farms being you know, the most prominent. Oh, for sure. And this is where the story gets even more bizarre with this Mandy character. Mandy. Oh, Mandy. You came and you teased with the picture. Now fucking go to bed, oh, Mandy. Mandy, show up at Anime Matsuri. I will sign your tits. I dare you to show up. Oh, goddamn. And Mandy... Mandy, listen to this. Listen to me, girl. Wherever on your tits you like, I will sign them. Take that. Camelot, hey, do you know Mandy? Yeah. Mandy's How can someone not know Mandy? She has nice tits. Mandy is so does. fucking gorgeous. Would eat that ass. <laughs> oh my God. Mandy. If I were single, Mandy, you would never be single again. Mandy, if I were not married, girl, I would wreck you. I would save you. I would do whatever on earth. Camelot, I don't need MDMA from what Mandy. What was trying Mandy, to be Mandy? Mandy is so goddamn hot. Mandy is fucking phenomenally hot. I'm a, I'm a Christian, trad, whatever. 
Lady Rackets will tell you that you are fucking fire. I don't need to say a goddamn word. And listen, Mandy is gorgeous. She's a gorgeous woman. And Lady Rackets would fucking fawn over Mandy. A top fan in his locals chat, known for, let's say, suggestive comments, constantly vying for his attention. This is where you have to remember, this guy's a lawyer. Right. Someone who you think would be able to sniff out a scam a mile away. You would think. Yeah, all about that. Turns out Mandy, not so much a Mandy, it was a man named Daniel Harris, older than Mick, who'd been catfishing him for years. Stolen photos, made up stories, voice calls, the whole nine yards. It's almost like you laugh, but it's also kind of sad, right? It is. The supposed trad dad lawyer yeah. getting played like a fiddle by some guy pretending to be a woman online. You really cannot make this stuff up. But this is also where it goes from just being a personal anecdote, right? To a cautionary tale about the dangers of online personas and these parasocial relationships. Especially when you add in that whole hedonism the second thing. Remember those cryptic posts about his Jamaican vacation? Oh yeah. Okay guys, I got a question for you. I'm taking Lady Rackets to Jam Fuck, Jamaica. I wasn't supposed to say what island. I fucked up. That's a drunk. Drunkness. The internet sleuths. Always one step ahead, they quickly identified that location. Turns out it's a swingers resort. Mm -hmm. Just completely blew up that carefully constructed family man image. And blew it to smithereens. Completely. And you know, he tries to deny it. Of course. But the internet, yeah. the internet never forgets. Never forgets and loves hypocrisy. Like that's the fuel. Oh, it's prime rib. Oh yeah. For the internet. This is where you see that lol cow yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. In full effect. His thread on Kiwi Farms, it just explodes. I mean, users are documenting every drunken rant, his obsession with this baldo thing. Still. Even a drunken confession, which who knows how true it is, about visiting a gay bar for an underwear party. Two lesbians tried to pick us up and two two gay men tried to have sex with me. I, I like, I don't know. We had a, none of them succeeded. It was a good fucking time. Oh boy. It's wild. That's quite a leap from uh, uncancelable. Talk about a contrast. Yeah, Mr. Uncancelable over here. Right, the persona he's trying to build. Yeah. And of course what happens? Viewership drops, local subscriptions plummet. Those super chats that were once flowing like wine. Oh yeah. They slow to a trickle. Even Rumble, I think, starts having second thoughts about their golden boy. Yeah, the shine wears off. It does. <laughs> and just when you think, okay, it can't get weirder. It can't possibly. Hold my beer. He finds new friends. The Imholtz from the Steel Toe Morning Show. Oh, this is where they enter the picture. They do. And they start collaborating, sharing an audience, and even hinting at, you guessed it, more swinging. Oh yeah, adding fuel to the fire. Pouring gasoline on it at this yeah. point. Yeah. And it all kind of culminates in May 2024 with this police raid on his home. Yeah, this is where it goes from uh, oh, yeah. internet shenanigans to real life consequences. Because now we're talking cocaine, paraphernalia, yeah. the whole shebang. He's charged with drug possession, child neglect, and then of course there's the infamous coke stream. Oh, we have to talk about the coke stream, this train wreck. Just days before the arrest, this horrifying glimpse into the meltdown, he's disheveled, rambling incoherently, and it appears he that he's, well, engaging in some on-camera self-gratification. Yeah. Which, according to the warrant, was actually part of the evidence that was presented to Judge Fisher. And if you're keeping score, that's the same judge from Nick's whole defamation case with Monograph. Oh, wow. Worlds colliding. Talk about worlds colliding. You can't make this stuff it's like, up. what are the odds? Right. So initially, people think, okay, slap on the wrist, maybe some probation. But then the charges get upgraded. They do. To a second degree felony, which is a whole different ballgame. You're talking about 25 years if he's convicted. Wow. And then the child neglect charges that brings in child protective services. This is not online drama anymore. No. This is serious stuff. This is real life. And everyone starts to backpedal. I mean, Fox News, Daily Mail, everyone's covering it. This house of cards is collapsing. And then, as if things couldn't get any worse, Enter Aaron M. Holt stage left, the supposed friend from the Steel Toe Morning Show, and he delivers, I don't know if it's a final blow because it seems like there's a new blow every week. Right. But he really goes in. Yeah, he does. He does, goes public, starts detailing the drug use, the swinging, paints this really dark picture of Nick. 
He does. Which, you know, I guess we'll talk about Aaron and his motivations and all that. Right, we've got to unpack that. Yeah, we'll unpack that. For sure. But it's a lot there. It's brutal, but it does seem to confirm, I don't know, a lot of what the online world had been piecing together, you know, for months at that point. Yeah, it lends credence to it for sure. And look, as if this story couldn't get any more tragic, we get these leaked documents from Child Protective Services, and they reveal that one of his kids tested positive for cocaine. Oh, man. And not a small amount either. Ten times the threshold for a false positive, according to those documents. It's just, I don't know, it's tough to hear that suddenly those memes, that lol cow label, it all feels pretty insignificant. Absolutely. It's a harsh reminder that we're dealing with real people here, huh. families, real world consequences. Nick, of course, tries to deflect, says nobody has the full story, but the damage is done. His reputation, his career shot. Yeah. And he's staring down some serious legal trouble. Yeah. And then in a last act of, I don't even know what to call it, he files revenge porn charges against Aaron Imhold. Oh, no kidding. Yep. Adds another layer to this whole messy situation, just when you think it can't get any more complicated. It's like watching a car crash, a train wreck, and a dumpster fire all at once. It's a lot to process. But it's fascinating, isn't it? In a disturbing kind of way. This deep dive into the dark side of online fame, the potential consequences. And it really brings us to that bigger question, doesn't it? What can we, as both consumers and participants in this online world, learn from something like this, from Nick Rikita's very public downfall? It's easy to get caught up in it, right? The drama, the gossip, that schadenfreude element. Oh, for sure. But this story, it highlights those very real dangers when those lines between our online personas and our offline lives, they start to blur and then they completely disappear. The internet can be ruthless and unforgiving. Anonymity, it emboldens people, information spreads like wildfire, and once you're in the crosshairs of that court of public opinion, good luck escaping it. Nick Rikita, he built his career on being the internet's trad dad lawyer. That was his thing. But that persona, well, it couldn't withstand the weight of his own actions. And the people he surrounded himself with, online and offline, they played a role too. Let's not let them off the hook. This whole case, it's a cautionary tale, that's for sure. It's a reminder to be mindful of those personas we create online, to be wary of that allure of instant fame, instant validation, and to really consider the human cost, the real world cost of our actions in this digital age. Because the internet, unlike Nick Rikito's career, it shows no signs of slowing down. And that's our deep dive for today. It's heavy stuff, it's a lot to unpack. And if you're anything like us, you probably have more questions than answers right now, but hopefully you're walking away with a renewed sense of, I don't know, caution as you navigate this ever evolving landscape of the internet. I know it's her job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here?